in more ways than one. And what I'm getting at here is my intention, first of all, to, to sort of keep the focus of this talk on our wild native bees, the bees that are naturally occurring and nesting and foraging in the wild. Um, and then also, I have sort of hand selected for this talk a number of bee genera and species that occur here in Minnesota and exhibit these really wild and amazing life history patterns, behavioral traits, um, appearances, and things like that. So wild in more ways than one. This should be a fun, light, happy talk. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the Xerces Society, the organization that I work for. Um, so we are a nonprofit conservation group focused on the protection of invertebrates and their habitats. That includes pollinators, but is not limited to pollinators. Um, we take our name from this butterfly here, the Xerces blue butterfly, which is the first butterfly to go extinct in North America. Um, and that was what prompted Robert Michael Pyle to found the Xerces Society over 40 years ago, started as a butterfly conservation group, and have since broadened our focus to include lots of different invertebrate groups, typically focusing on those that are most um, at risk. Uh, so we have an endangered species program doing amazing work right now on bumblebees, freshwater mussels, um, which are one of our most imperiled groups of animals in North America. We have an aquatic program looking at things like mosquito management and um, migratory dragonflies. We have a pesticide program doing a lot of work to support farmers and um, policymakers and citizens in decisions surrounding pesticide use and regulation. Um, and then we have a pollinator conservation program, which is the program for which I work. Um, our biggest program. And just a little bit more about what we do. So we have staff on the ground, pretty much nationwide, um, doing conservation education, largely to farmers, farm agency professionals. Um, and then we also do a lot of habitat restoration. So we've supported over 200,000 acres of habitat in the US since 2008. I did bring quite a few materials with today that I thought would be relevant to you guys, and you have a few things in your toolkit, but I also just wanted to point out we have a lot of pollinator conservation resources on our website for you to check out later. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into my talk now, um, fully recognizing that for these first few slides, I feel like I'm definitely preaching to the choir. I don't think I need to convince you guys about the importance of pollinators, especially after walking through the parking lot and seeing all the pollinator-friendly bumper stickers <laughs> on everybody's cars. Um, but I did include some of this thinking that these might be good talking points for you as you're doing your outreach or in the conversations that you're having with people about these issues. So we know that pollinators are critical to human health. Um, about two-thirds of our crop species require pollinators for fruit set or seed set. Um, and then about a third, about 35% of crop production, or, or you can think of this as the diet, our diets, the food we actually consume, is pollinator dependent. And that, of course, includes most of our fruits, vegetables, nuts, um, many really important foods for our human nutrition. And um, also, quite obviously, there's a lot of um, economic value to these, these services. Something I think you hear a little bit less about, at least in the mainstream media, is how important pollinators are to our natural ecosystems. Our prairies, obviously, our woodlands, um, even our wetlands are, are very pollinator dependent. So more than 85% of flowering plants require an animal, and typically that animal is an insect, and typically that insect is a bee, to move pollen. Um, and what this means is that the longevity and diversity of both our remnant and our restored plant communities requires healthy and diverse pollinator communities. So you can imagine if you lose pollinators from, from a given ecosystem, like in this case a prairie, um, you would tend to see that plant community shift towards being more grass dominated. Does that make sense? Because grasses are not pollinator dependent um, and you'd lose diversity. And I think this might make more sense also if you look at some differences between flowers. So do you guys know this plant on the right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, bottle gentian. 
So this is a perfect example of a plant that's it's categorized as restricted access, meaning its pollen and nectar are down here, um, not readily accessible to just anyone. In fact, only a bumblebee is strong enough to pry open that blossom and get in, access the pollen and nectar, and effectively cross-pollinate that plant. Um, there are, amazingly, other bees that will come and chew a hole right here and nectar rob, um, but that doesn't do anything for the plant. That doesn't spread the pollen of the plant. Um, so if you lost bumblebees or had a severe decline in bumblebees, what do you think would happen to bottle gentian? It would probably fade out or decline. Contrast that with something like, what's this plant? Yeah, this is rigid goldenrod, um, open access, flower, everything's right out there. Um, if you lost bumblebees, what do you think would happen? Possibly other insects? Yeah, probably soldier beetles, honeybees, uh, lots of other different kinds of bees, wasps, would continue to ensure that seed sets still happen for that plant. So it does vary by plant, um, how dependent they are on certain bees. And I think I should also point out that certain bees need certain plants. And you guys may have heard of these types of bees before, but basically they're just picky eaters. Um, the technical <laughs> term is oligolectic or specialist bees. Um, but they only feed their larvae pollen from specific plant taxa. So that might be a plant family, it might be a genus, it might even be a plant species that they're restricted to. Uh, the percent of bees that have this picky eater syndrome varies regionally, but it can be as high as 40 to 50% of bees in a given area. Um, and what I'm pointing out here with these pictures are representatives of three different plant families that tend to host high numbers of specialist bees. So the asters, um, represented here by native field thistle. How, I'm curious how many of you are aware of this plant? A native thistle, mm -hmm. a few of you. Okay, you all are now. We have native thistles here in Minnesota. They're amazing, they're highly attractive to a huge number of pollinators. Um, I'm also calling out purple prairie clover, plant that's probably quite familiar to you guys as a representative of the Fabaceae, and then willows. Good plants to include in your landscape along with representatives of so many other plant families, of course. Diversity is always key. Um, I am focusing this talk on bees, but I just wanted to take a minute and acknowledge that bees aren't the only pollinators. There are a lot of other important floral visitors, um, and many of these are really important in natural pest control on farms as well. But why are bees considered the most important pollinators? They're effective and efficient. They have structures that carry pollen. Why, that's exactly what I'm getting at. So why do they have structures that carry pollen? To feed their young, yeah. So of all those insects I just showed you on that previous slide that hang out on flowers, maybe find a mate on flowers, um, eat pollen and nectar themselves as adults, bees are the only ones, um, with a few exceptions and some weird wasps, but bees are, by and large, the only ones that actively collect pollen onto their bodies, carry it around, and eventually carry it home to feed their babies. So they have these bodies that are well, well adapted to collecting large amounts of pollen. You can see all the hairs on this bee. Um, a lot of bees have pollen baskets on their legs. They're moving a lot of pollen around because they're gathering it all day to feed their babies. Um, and then the other neat thing about bees is that they exhibit floral constancy where they will learn a given flower and then they'll work that flower until that resource is depleted, which from a plant's perspective, if you're an apple blossom, that's exactly what you want is pollen from another apple, not pollen from a dandelion or pollen from a willow or something else that's in bloom. So it works out well for plants. This slide is just highlighting how diverse um, our native bees are. We have around 3,600 species in the, in the United States. In Minnesota, roughly 400. The, the Minnesota DNR is doing some neat work right now trying to actually tease that number out. 
Uh, but this image is showing, this is a real photo, showing the smallest bee in North America on the head of the largest bee. <laughs> so amazing diversity in size, not to mention color, you know, body shape, life history, behavior, all of these other things. OK, am I, there we go. Um, wild bees also exhibit a range of social behaviors. And I'm going to kind of talk you through each of these, starting with um, social bees, which I think probably most of you are, are familiar with because honeybees are social and bumblebees are also social. But what you have going on with social bees is division of labor. So typically, this is in the form of a queen that lays eggs, workers that forage, and males that pretty much mate. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, OK, wait, though. You've got division of labor. And then you also have overlapping generations in the hive. So you have adults that are interacting with larvae. And then those larvae are emerging as adults. And you've got overlapping generations. Contrast that with the far other end of the spectrum, which this represents most of our native bees, for sure. Um, and these are, this is the solitary bees. And what you have going on here is a female who does the egg laying and the foraging. So there are no queens. There are no workers. She's doing it all. Um, and there's typically not um, overlapping generations in the hive. So she'll usually create her nest, provision that nest, lay eggs, and then she's gone. So she never meets those babies when they turn into adults. She never sees them again. OK, and then in between, there are all sorts of crazy um, social behaviors kind of on this continuum that help us actually understand how sociality, which is a highly sophisticated thing for an insect to, to do, how that evolved. So semi-social bees, there are examples of green sweat bees that have typically four females in a nest, four adult females in a nest. And they all can lay eggs, and they all can forage. But some of them have slender ovaries and do more of the foraging. Some of them have larger ovaries and do more of the egg laying. So you can see there's, there's a little bit of division of labor, but um, it's not quite fully divided. There's communal bees, where you may have up to 25 females, adult females, sharing a nest. Um, but there's no evidence of division of labor. So they're all going out and foraging. They're all laying their own eggs. Yet they share this space together for some reason. There are examples, quite a few examples, of gregarious bees, where they, they're basically just like a solitary bee, a female. She makes her own nest. She provisions it. But rather than making it in isolation, um, multiple females will create nests near each other. Um, and there are at least some, some accounts of a female from one nest looking out over her neighboring nest, sort of babysitting the neighboring nest while the females in those neighboring nests are out foraging. Because there are a lot of parasitic insects that will come and, and do damage to insect nests, these bee nests, if somebody's not watching. So kind of amazing, isn't it? All the different um, strategies to living your life. And those are just a few. OK, maybe the battery is low in this clicker, too. Um, oh, there we go. Slow. <laughs> OK, so I typically wrap my head around native bee um, diversity in terms of habitat. So we have ground nesting bees. We have stem or wood nesting bees or cavity nesting bees. And then we have bumblebees, which are sort of this little category on their own. And they kind of nest all over the place. But I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, all of you have in your, in your toolkit a diagram, a pie chart, really colorful pie chart. Um, yeah, this one. That shows the, the relative diversity of the major bee groups. Um, this is in the United States, so it's not just Minnesota. But there's little symbols indicating if the, the bee is solitary or social or ground or cavity nesting. But Joel Gardner put that together, and I think that, that will maybe help you wrap your head around this a little bit more, too. 
Um, but then we also have this, this additional category, just to, just to mix things up a little bit, um, called cuckoo bees. And these are bees that don't make their own nest, but like cuckoo birds, they usurp the nest of another bee. Um, they typically locate that nest that they're going to take over by smell. So I often see cuckoo bees flying really low to the ground, just back and forth, searching out a nest to parasitize. Um, they look a lot like wasps, more like wasps than bees, because they're not doing any foraging. They don't need to provision a nest, so they don't have all these hairs to collect pollen. Um, hence, they're more, a little more wasp-like. Kind of, they kind of seem, I think, maybe at first glance, like a bad thing, one bee that's taking out another bee. Um, but in reality, they can be really good indicators of ecosystem health, because they're sort of one more step, one more link in the, in the food chain, if you want to think of it like that. Um, just as an example, so you guys all are probably rather familiar with the rusty patch bee, bumblebee, here in Minnesota. <gasps> There's another bumblebee that parasitizes the rusty patch bee that's far more rare than the rusty patch bee. It actually, Elaine Evans, who does a lot of bumblebee surveys here, hasn't seen it since the 90s. And that's probably because rusty patch has declined so much, and this bee needs rusty patch to, to make it. So interesting bees. Back to the ground nesting bees. Um, so nearly 70% of our bees nest in the ground. That's most of our native bees. The, the nest can resemble ant nest. How many of you have seen ground nesting bees? OK, I won't dwell on this too much then, but this is a little bit what they look like. Um, how many of you have seen ground nests excavated? <laughs> a few of you. OK, so this is one that's been dug up. You can see the main shaft. And then um, there's some cells down here that have been created. Each cell is provisioned with its own ball of pollen and nectar called bee bread. And then a single egg is laid on that, which hatches into a larva. Eventually, this individual will emerge as an adult. Here's the, the life cycle of a typical ground nesting bee. So we'll start with an adult in spring. She's collecting pollen to provision her nest. She digs out this nest, starts scraping off pollen into there, um, eventually shapes that into a nice bee bread, lays an egg, larva hatches, develops, pupates, and it all starts over again. But, but what I want to point out is this adult phase in, in many of these bees can be as little as two weeks. So most of the bee's life is underground. Oops. Lots of different types of ground nesting bees. Um, I will talk through a few of these that, that I find to be especially interesting. Squash bees are one. So I'm calling them out partly because they're, they're native bee and they're also one of our most important crop pollinators. So they specialize on, they will only feed on members of the cucurbitaceae, so cucumbers, squash, pumpkins. They're really important pollinators of squash and pumpkins. Um, they dig nests near or under food plants, so they're typically nesting right in the crop field, which can be important um, to know if you're, if you're using any pesticides uh, in that system. They are active in early morning hours, typically before sunrise, um, far earlier than honeybees are active. And they're also well known for being really excellent at locating new isolated populations of their preferred plants. So if you go in your backyard and start a garden where you've never gardened before and plant squash where you've never planted squash before, they will very likely come and find that planting. And I'm not going to show this video, but, but if you have time on your own, I would recommend it. It's, it's a little four minute video that one of my coworkers put together on squash bee natural history. Hmm on YouTube. <clears throat> Another ground nesting bee um, that I love is Melisodes bimaculata, the two-spotted longhorn. And it's, it gets its name from these two spots on the rear end of the female. Um, the males don't have those spots, but the males are also distinct in being all black and having this white face, really long antennae. You guys can see that. 
Um, they're a generalist forager. I see them all over Minnesota on all different kinds of plants, crop plants, wild plants. This is on basil. This is on mountain mint, um, which is another plant you guys should all be growing for its attractiveness to bees and especially wasps. Um, because they, they're active in the summer, they're important pollinators of summer blooming crops. And I, mostly I love them because they're so easy to ID. I like bees that I can ID at the species level with the naked eye, not having to collect them or pin them or look in a book or anything. They're easy to ID. So you guys probably will be able to see and find this bee. Um, these are some nests uh, of Melisodes. So do you think this is the two-spotted longhorn? Doesn't look like it. No. Yeah. No. Look. So it's obviously a female because she's making a nest, and it doesn't have those two spots. It's a different kind of Melisodes. But I just wanted to show you some examples of their nest. They kind of had this turret around the entrance. And um, this is a, a little nest aggregation. And again, it, it's hard to say if it, maybe nesting sites are just limited, and this was the best place, and that's why all these females are here, or maybe they're um, sharing some, some tasks with each other a little bit. Okay, Kalides plaster bees, so this is another type of, of ground nesting bee, and they get their name from the unique lining of their cells. Um, they actually secrete saliva and then some other secretion from another gland in their abdomen and mix it together and it creates this polyester type material and they use that to line their nest um, and it makes the nest nice and waterproof. They um, are, in terms of what they look like, they have kind of a heart-shaped face, which you guys can see because I overlaid it, but um, the eyes are really convergent. Um, and then they have a short tongue, which I wouldn't expect you to see with the naked eye, but, but it's pretty diagnostic um, in terms of identifying them from other bee groups. So those are the, the plaster bees or polyester bees. Another type of, of ground nesting bee that actually nests in decayed wood. Um, so I'm calling this bee out because most of its relatives nest in the ground. Most sweat bees are ground nesting, but this one uh, makes nests in, in decayed wood with similar architecture to the ground nesting bees. So unusual nesting habitat. They forage on all kinds of things. Um, you guys see green sweat bees quite a bit. Yeah, they're pretty common. Um, they're also unique in that they are able to buzz pollinate, which is something that bumblebees are well known for, um, but you don't hear about it so much in the sweat bees. And, and basically what this is is the ability to detach your flight muscles from your wings and instead use those strong muscles to power a vibration in the entire body which results in pollen deposition, typically on the back of the head. And some plants, um, the Solanaceae are well known for this, um, some plants are unable to release their pollen unless they get that buzz pollination. So I see sweat bees on, on, on tomatoes quite a bit. And this is where they nest. So this is an actual nest of this species. Big old decayed log under the bark, you can see the larvae, and up closer, um, there's a larva. The cell was actually lined with pollen, and there's an a adult that has just emerged, another adult. So really good reason to leave decayed wood in your landscape. Leave brush piles, leave snags, leave logs, leave, leave leaf litter. Now, do they form a colony, or this? Pretty solitary. That's a good question. The, the green sweat bees are typically thought of as solitary bees, but there's a lot that are kind of in that continuum. There's some social ones as well. OK, so the, those were the ground nesting bees. Now I'm moving on to a new category, the stem or wood nesting bees, or tunnel nesting bees. Um, and this, is, this represents about 30% of our native bees. And they will typically use things like hollow or pithy plant stems, like, oops, sorry. 
like you can see here and here. Um, and some species will use the, the holes or tunnels left in wood by beetles, beetle, boring beetle larvae. When they emerge and leave this tunnel, bees will move in. Um, and then these, of course, are also the bees that will use the bee blocks and stem bundles and other artificial nest um, structures that, that people create. Their life cycle is similar to the ground nesting bees. Um, you've got an egg that develops into a larva, eventually develops into an, into an adult. Uh, this is a, a typical nest. So the nests are in a linear series. Uh, the cells are partitioned. So once again, each egg is given its own little ball of resources. And then there's walls that are created between each cell. Um, and those walls can be made of mud, as you see here, or they can be made of leaves, like the leaf cutter bees will, will cut leaves and, and partition their cells with that. Um, flower petals can be used. One thing that I think is amazing is it's not unusual for it to take a bee all day to build and provision a single cell, so something like this here, and that can take over a thousand trips to flowers to get that much pollen and nectar to, to provision a cell. So a, a nest could easily take a week or more, and if there's bad weather in between, it could take even longer. Eggs that develop into females are usually laid in the bottom and given a little bit more resources, and the males are laid up here. So something that I haven't point, pointed out yet that is also amazing about bees and all hymenoptera is that they have this ability to control the sex of their offspring by choosing whether or not to fertilize the egg or not. Choosing whether to fertilize the egg or not. Um, so if, if a female wants to make a worker or another female, she fertilizes that egg. If she wants a male, she lays an unfertilized egg. Hmm. Yeah. So how do they get out of there? Yeah, right. they chew their way out. Um, and if these ones in the back emerge first, they carefully avoid their siblings and, and chew out the entrance. <laughs> OK, so here in Minnesota, we have approximately 13 different bee genera that have at least some representatives that use stems. And this includes our mason bees, uh, really important pollinators of our, a lot of our tree fruits. Small carpenter bees, leaf cutter bees, these are the ones that chew these nice circular holes into leaves. You guys have probably seen that. Um, yellow face bees, these are a tinier cavity nesting bee. I am going to focus on these small carpenter bees because they're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> no reason other than that. <laughs> OK, and I like them, again, because they're a tiny bee but they're very easy to identify, just visually. So they're, they're distinctive in being kind of metallic and shiny. Uh, they're not super hairy, so at first glance, you might not even realize that they're a bee. But they have a really unique shape to them. I don't know if you guys can see this, but the abdomen has constrictions on it that kind of remind me of a plastic water bottle with those constrictions going down. Um, and then they also have on the face, if you can get a good look at the face, they have white markings on the face in both sexes. Maybe I'll, I'll wait for that noise to pass. <laughs> Is this still okay? OK, so as far as the nesting biology of these small carpenter bees, they, these are the ones that nest in twigs um, and stems. And they're called small carpenter bees because they're good builders. They have strong jaws. They actually chew their own um, hole, as opposed to some of those other bees that need a pre-existing hollow space to nest in. So they don't occupy bee blocks, because they don't want a hole that's already created for them. They want to make their own hole. Um, they do need a cut end to make their nest. So it, it's hard for them to chew through bark, um, but something like this here is perfect. Um, so that can be a good reason to, to once in a while go out and prune your shrubs and, and your prairie plants and expose some cut ends. 
They'll use things like raspberries, um, other types of brambles, sumac, New England aster, cup plant. These are photos courtesy of Colleen Satisher at the University of Minnesota Bee Lab who is doing some interesting work on these types of cavity nesting bees. They're generalist pollinators. Um, I see them most frequently on our farm on raspberries, and, um, and then they also nest in raspberries. So it's sort of a unique situation where one plant is providing both foraging and nesting resources for this bee. Um, they're active early in the spring, but activity continues throughout the summer. Another really amazing thing about this bee is that it's one of few bees that exhibits parenting behavior. Um, so the female actually, she creates that nest in the, in the stem, and then she doesn't just fly away and leave it. She makes a room for herself at the entrance, and she stays there sometimes for an entire year and guards that nest, occasionally opening up the cells of her babies and checking on them, um, making sure there's no mold or disease, um, making sure the food is intact. And then when those larvae emerge as adults, she actually gives them, in some cases, gives them their first meal, which is really unusual because adults can go out and forage for themselves, but she gives them their first meal and then they're on their own. So really good mothers here. <laughs> and the, another cool thing about these bees is they overwinter as adults. So you can go out, I went out in January and opened up a bunch of stems and you can find them as adults just hibernating the winter away, usually in big groups with their siblings. Okay, any questions about cavity nesters? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the question is about, I think, what happens when we cut down all of our flower garden debris and throw it away? Are we destroying cavity nesting bees? To I think a lot of the <laughs> yes. So yeah, people are obsessed with clean gardens. This is considered part of cleaning the garden. Yeah, we need to turn that around. Um, and I think if, if you can get people to just open up stems and look inside and see what's in there, I am so serious. Every stem I opened when I went out to this field site pretty much had a bee or a wasp or a spider, some kind of insect in it. Stems, dead stems, and some of these were two-year-old stems, so pretty far gone stems are still really, really important nesting and shelter resources for a lot of insects. So yeah, we need to turn that perception around, I think. Is that all woody plants then, or is that just some herbaceous plants? Yeah, herbaceous plants as well, certainly, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, different, different insects are emerging at different times, so it's hard to say any one time. But I would, if you do have to remove stuff, I would not throw it away. Not throw it away, but just put it somewhere else. You know, put it on the side of your shed or somewhere that's relatively protected and where these bees can still emerge and come out. Um, but in nature, if you think about it, nobody is going and clearing plants away. Things die and decompose and organic matter builds up and you get healthier soils and yeah. Yeah. You don't have to take everything, you can leave some and 15 inches is maybe a good cutting level. Okay, so I'm going to move on to bumblebees. So this last category of native bees. Here in Minnesota, we are very lucky to have really high bumblebee diversity. We have around 18 different species of bumblebees here. Um, as compared to some of the southern states with just a few species, South America, just a few species. So bumblebees are one of few animal groups that actually increases in diversity with latitude. They really like our northern climate. 
Um, this is a neat chart that Elaine Evans put together showing bumblebee diversity in Minnesota. And I also just wanted to point out that bumblebees are a really approachable group in terms of getting to know them and ID them. Their ID is based mostly on the color patterns on their bodies, the colors of these hairs. So fun and interesting to, to get to know. Their life cycle, um, I'll start right here with where we're at right now, kind of in between winter and spring. But this is a, an overwintering queen. So right now outside, the only bumblebees we have are queens that have overwintered. Um, and as it starts to warm up, these queens will emerge out of hibernation and begin to search for a nest. And you guys have probably seen this, but again, it's this low flying back and forth behavior, really big bumblebees looking for a nest. That's what we'll be seeing, um, hopefully not today with how warm it is, but in, in the coming months. So the queen finds a nest, um, begins provisioning that nest, collecting pollen and nectar, and um, lays a batch of eggs on those provisions. Those eggs are all female, because she wants females. They emerge as workers and begin taking over those foraging duties. Um, they also begin taking over the care of their sisters, so the next batch of eggs that the, the queen lays. The colony grows and builds up in numbers, and at a certain point um, in, I typically start seeing males in around, like July, um, the, but the queen, at a certain point, the queen will start making males by laying unfertilized eggs, and she will also make um, new queens. And queen determination in, in bumblebees is, is kind of interesting. It's, it's not determined by a special food that the new queen gets, but rather the quantity of food. So if the workers give a developing female a lot of food, she's likely to develop into a, a queen. Um, OK, and then males and females from different colonies of the same species will somehow find each other, mate. Um, and at a certain point in the fall, after a number of freezes, everybody dies. The workers die, the old queen dies. The, the males die, um, and the only ones that make it are these newly mated queens. And it all begins again. So that nest, when this, the queen emerges, is that underground? Uh, oh, right here. No, that's the hibernating, but then when it emerges to, yeah, the colony. Yeah, OK, I'll get to that. Where, where are these bumblebees nesting? Right. Good question. Um, this is just a picture uh, showing nest establishment. So this is a big queen. She's found her nest, obviously, and she's loaded down with pollen, um, starting to, to provision that nest. And I also wanted to point out that this is the most vulnerable phase of a bumblebee life cycle. This early spring, um, you know, erratic weather patterns, queens might emerge only to get snowed on or you know have the weather freeze only to find that there's actually no food available because the plants aren't in sync with the weather um, and then also everything is just hinging on this you know small number of individuals so it can be i would definitely recommend making sure that your own yard has early spring resources for bumblebees and things like willows even some of the trees maples can provide really early pollen but getting to your question, Jim, about where these bumblebees are nesting, um, these are some examples of nests that I've found on our farm. The, the running theme with bumblebee nests is that they don't make their own cavity, but they need to find a pre-existing cavity. Typically, and, and preferably something soft and warm and fuzzy. So typically, they're found in association with mouse nests, abandoned mouse nests. Um, and all of these nests on my farm were indeed in association with, with mouse nests. And you can find that out at the end of the season when everybody has died. You can go in, if you've been watching that nest and you know where it is, you can go in and dig it up gently and see how big it is and, and if there's um, evidence of a mouse nest present. So insulation and you know the stuff that mice bring together to, to make a nest fuzzy. Um, so this is one in tall grasses, this is one in straw mulch, pine needles. This was one in a raised bed with a lot of organic matter. 
Um, people will report them in bee boxes or bird boxes, um, gutters, farm equipment that hasn't been moved in a while. This is, if I can get this, yeah, this is my favorite one. So this is another one from our farm. Um, and the way I tell the story is, like all good farms, we have a junkyard at our place. And it, it was kind of getting out of hand. Um, so we ordered this dumpster over here. And we were going to clear out the things that we knew we didn't need. Um, and this is one of those things that we thought should probably go, right? Nobody needs this old grill. Um, but we picked it up to throw it in the dumpster, and it started buzzing. <laughs> and. At first glance, so this is what we saw when we opened it up. And at first glance, it looks like this paper wasp nest might be responsible right, for the buzzing. But this was actually an abandoned paper wasp nest, totally empty. Instead, it was th this mouse nest, also abandoned, that bumblebees had moved into. And the cool thing is they were using these four holes to go in and out of their nice <laughs> nest. So needless to say, we still have this grill sitting around. <laughs> uh, also inside the nest, um, so again, egg, larva, pupa, uh, colony. What I want to highlight here is how different this bumblebee provisioning is compared to the solitary bees. So remember how all those solitary bees had separate bedrooms, essentially, for each offspring, and they all got their own ball of food. In contrast, bumblebees just make a big pile of food and lay a bunch of eggs on it. And they, can, they fend for themselves, figure it out. That's more like how it was in my family, with a whole bunch of kids. And <laughs> uh, a little bit more on the males. So I mentioned already that males are the result of an unfertilized egg. So they have no father. They only have you know, genetic material from their mother. And, and likewise, they, they cannot have sons. Um, they have no nest duties. So as soon as they are ready to emerge, they leave the nest to mate, and they never return, which is why you often see them hanging around late summer on flowers, even at night. They don't have a stinger, um, which makes them really fun to hold and pet. And you can give them to kids, and nobody has to worry about getting stung. And shockingly, I mean, look how small the males are compared to the queen that they're mating with. How am I doing on time? OK. OK, so I will talk a little bit about foraging behavior then in bumblebees. Um, also, I wanted to recommend this book by Dave Goulson. If you're interested in learning more about bumblebee, life history, ecology, conservation, I highly recommend this book. It's called Bumblebee Behavior, Ecology, and Conservation, basically what I just said. Um, but in this book, they talk a little bit about foraging um, recruitment in bumblebees. And you guys are probably familiar with foraging recruitment in honeybees, where honeybees do a waggle dance. Right to indicate to their fellow workers the direction and the distance to some high quality food source. Highly sophisticated behavior. Um, bumblebees for a long time were thought to not do anything of the sort. No foraging recruitment or, or dance behavior at all. Um, but now it's known that they actually do do some foraging recruitment and they do do a dance. Um, I'm not sure what the dance is called. But basically, it's just like a crazy, chaotic movement that doesn't indicate, it doesn't relay direction or distance of, of a food source. But it does tell the other workers, there's good food out there. Go forth and forage. So it, it motivates workers to get out of the hive and go do some foraging. And, and they do that dance when they find high quality resources. Um, and he, he speculates on some of the reasons for why honeybees do this really specified dance and why bumblebees do, do it differently. So I, I'm not going to give it away, but I would read that chapter of that book. I also wanted to talk a little bit about bumblebee decline. This is the only unhappy part of my talk, I think. Um, 
And you can imagine, so decline in native bees is pretty difficult to track. It's not like honeybees where you can go out and see your, how many colonies have died and how many bees you've lost. Um, because a lot of these bees are nesting in really small nests scattered across the landscape. How do you track that? Um, Bumblebees are one group of native bees that we do have some, some good evidence of their decline only because they're, they're big charismatic bees and they have a long history of being collected. So we have really, really um, numerous records from museum collections and other databases that enabled us to look at how are bumblebees doing in the most recent decade compared to historical time periods. So we did this analysis of all 48 bumblebee species in North America. Um, and the results of this work, we, we looked at range decline, um, and we looked at relative abundance decline. And what we found is that a quarter of our bumblebees are at risk of extinction today using IUCN criteria, which is basically the global criteria for evaluating extinction risk. And that includes about six species here in Minnesota, um, it falling into one of these threatened categories here, including the rusty patch, which we hear a lot about, um, also the yellow banded bumblebee, another one that's declining, and that we have a pocket guide for um, if you want to learn how to ID it and submit a photo of it. And causes of this decline are really similar to, to honeybees. Um, Habitat loss, pesticide use, uh, disease spread by commercial, commercial bees, climate change is something that um, has pretty serious implications for bumblebees, especially because they tend to be more northern creatures. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this citizen science project. Um, how many of you are already using Bumblebee Watch or familiar with Bumblebee Watch? OK. A few of you. Um, so basically, this is a citizen science project that Xerces launched, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, asking people to submit, sorry, you guys, is this OK? OK. Asking people to submit photo records of any bumblebees that they're seeing. And this is in recognition of the fact that so many bumblebees in North America are in decline, and we need to know more about where they're still occurring and what their relative abundances are. So this is how it works. You t take a picture of a bumblebee. Wait for your clicker to respond. OK. Um, there's your picture. You upload it. You can either use your phone or you can use your camera and your computer, but you upload it to this website. Um, and the first thing it asks you is, where did you see it? So you can use this Google Maps interface to put a point on the map. And it will automatically narrow down what bumblebees it might be based on you know, the, where you saw it. And then you can further narrow down the possibilities by um, selecting different features that are apparent on your bee. So if you, if you can see from your picture that your bee had yellow hairs on the head, you select that, and it will narrow it down further. And if you can't see, you ignore that question and go on to one that makes sense to you. Um, so eventually, you arrive at a tentative ID for your, for your bumblebee, hit submit. Um, we have experts around the country who are verifying the submission. So you'll get a little message back, thank you, yes, that's what it was, or actually, it was this species, thank you. Um, <laughs> and that will, oh yeah, and then you can also, you, if you want, you can use this as a way to manage your own bumblebee sightings and create this profile for yourself. But in the end, this is contributing to this tremendous database that we are gathering about bumblebees in North America and um, helping us to see you know, wh where the rare ones still are and um, how, how we can best help. Another thing that you can do on this website is submit sightings of bumblebee nests. And this is because there are, there's so little information known about the nesting requirements of so many of our bumblebees. So any sighting of a nest can also be pretty important. Um, so you take a picture of the nest itself and then also try to get a picture close enough that you can actually identify what bumblebee species it is. 
Um, one more little monitoring thing um, that we have developed tools for um, is we're, we're calling this just citizen science native bee monitoring. But basically, you learn how to identify the 10 different groups of native bees based on simply what they look like. So is it a big hairy bumblebee? Is it a green sweat bee? Is it a hairy belly bee? Um, there's 10 different categories. Is it a honey bee? And once you know those groups, you can select a locality. It might be your backyard. It might be a restoration project that you're working on. It might be, I use this quite a bit with farmers um, who want to look at what's pollinating their crops and also what's visiting the, the new plantings that we put in. OK, so you learn your bees, and then you select a site that you want to monitor. And you monitor it regularly, recording the abundance and the diversity of these different bee groups over time, um, for example, in response to habitat improvement. So a few of the questions that you can ask. Who's doing the pollinating around here? Um, if you build it, will they come? And the answer is, of course, yes. But I think it's really something to see that with your own eyes, how much your insect community changes when, um, when you put in native flowering habitat. What plants are most attractive to native pollinators is a question you can ask. Um, and you can, you can take it farther than that. You know, what plants are most attractive to wasps or to certain hoverflies or to honeybees? How does pollinator abundance diversity change in response to restoration? And this is something you can look at over several years. Um, how do remnant sites compare to restored sites? So I'm working with Maplewood Nature Center right now, and they have a lot of restoration plantings that they've done. And they also have some beautiful remnant little parcels um, in close proximity. And they have, we've trained volunteers now to do this monitoring. And now volunteers are going to be going out there and keeping track of differences between the remnants and the restored. And one of the things we're wondering is, will the bee community in the restored prairies start to resemble that that we're seeing in the, in the remnants with time. So how does pollinator communities change over the time? Also, how do pollinator communities change with the season? And again, this is, th this is something you can read about. We all know about that there's different bees active at different times of the year. But I think it's really fun to get out there and experience, the, experience these things firsthand. And I'm done a little bit early. Um, Questions? Yeah, could you comment on the use of commercial bumblebee <laughs> colonies and whether they are, you know, native where they're coming from and disease? Yeah, so the question, just to repeat it, was could I comment on the use of commercial bumblebees? Are they native? Is disease an issue? Um, so Bombus impatiens is the bumblebee that's most often used in this region as a commercial for a commercial pollinator, and it is native here. Um, but because of the way they're reared, um, they tend to commercial bumblebees do tend to have disease, and there is evidence that diseases from commercial bumblebees spread to wild bumblebee populations, and that they're a major factor in the decline of some of our rarest. Bumblebees. So I definitely try to encourage the farmers that I'm working with to avoid buying commercial bumblebees and instead uh, do one of the easiest things to do, which is create habitat to support wild, natural, naturally occurring bumblebees. Um, did that address your question? Yeah. yeah. I was afraid of. <laughs> yeah. OK. Um, Blue. Okay. Yeah. OK, so the question, I think, is about um, foraging distance of bees. And it, it really varies depending on the bee. Um, you can think of it, typically, if flight distance is correlated with body size. So bigger bees will fly further. Um, some of our smallest bees only fly a few hundred feet. Um, Honey bees will fly a few miles. So bumblebees will fly a few miles. Where do they nest? Um, I think as a general rule, again, it probably varies, but I think as a general rule, bees, bees prefer to nest close to foraging resources. 
So, yeah. Ooh, yeah, that's an awesome question. And one other question is it's dangerous going near the nest because I heard they bumblebees get more aggressive if you get near their nest. Yeah, okay. Bumblebees are very, very docile animals. I'll start by saying I have I have held so many bumblebees, including ones with stingers, and not gotten stung. Um, the only time I got stung was when I disturbed a nest. It was one of those pictures, the one from the raised bed, and I had actually hoed into the nest. This is my confession. Um, the net, and I tried to patch everything back together, and it, but the nest did fade out. It was a really small nest, and I got stung once, and it hurt for about 10 minutes. But yeah, I mean, they will sting if you, if you disturb their nest, but not if you just go up and, and carefully, you know, stand back a little bit and use the zoom on your camera and try to get a good picture. But it's, yeah, if you're just watching them, they're not bothered. Um, and then as far as your question about what, how, what makes a good bumblebee photo, try to get, I try to get about three photos. Actually, you'll, you'll find yourself taking maybe 15 photos and three of them will be decent. So try to get one of the top of the body, um, one of the side of the body, and then one, if you can, of the head. So hair color on the head can be pretty important for some species. Obviously, those hair patterns on the body are important, and side view can be helpful for a few species, too. Yeah? What is that on the um, bud right there? Yeah. What is that? This is a, a milkweed beetle. Um, it's a longhorn beetle. The larvae feed on milkweed roots, and the adults hang out. I'm not sure if they feed or not. But yeah, I think this is one of the most photogenic insects. It just, it looks, it, it, it looks right at you. Like, it's not scared. It doesn't try to hide. Um, yeah, and I should also just say thanks to Xerces Society members for their support all of these other funders, um, all of the farms that I've had the opportunity to work with here in the Midwest, and I'll talk more about my work with farms later today. Um, Xerces, other Xerces staff for a lot of these slides, as well as Colleen, and um, some of our other collaborators as well. More questions? Okay. I'm, I think I'm just about out of time, but maybe one or two more? Okay. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've never heard that, but keep watching. The comment was, she's watched bumblebees around Monarda flowers and they always go counterclockwise. Yeah, I don't know. I was just wondering if you wanted to do that bumblebee study, would you just do that? <laughs> bumblebee watch? Yeah. Yeah, I think you all have a postcard in your toolkit for bumblebee watch. Okay. And it has the website. Or you can just Google bumblebeewatch.org. One more question. Yeah, um, Dave, David Goulson was the Bumblebee book. Goulson, G-O-U-L-S-O-N. Okay, one more in the maroon. Yeah, you. Okay, could you just clarify a little bit about the native bees and the relationship to the native bees? Because I think that's something that people don't understand. Like, what is the Right. Yeah, and so no. the squash. I'm glad you noticed that. So the squash bee is a species that has moved in range as squash has moved in range up to the North American, uh, you know, to northern North America. But yeah, typically native plants are are best suited to support native bees because of this really, really long co-evolutionary relationship. But you all know native bees will visit other plants in our gardens. You know, they'll take what they can get. Um, but, but it really makes a difference. If you convert your yard to native plants, it really makes a difference in terms of the butterflies you see, the bees you see, insects all across the board. Okay, thank you all very much.